But I think Sarah and, T and Tim both bring something unique to the ticket that, number one, plays well with Donald Trump in the sense of, of, of being a, a perfect match or foil for his uh, brand of campaigning and how they would campaign. But also it brings uh, a governorship as far as executive experience. And Tim Scott is someone he's worked with in Congress. So Trump is a numbers guy. Who is doing best in the ratings? Who's on television? Who's savvy in the media? Who's a really good surrogate who can drive up those numbers on ratings? And then also who does well in the polling and makes up for a gap that perhaps Trump isn't doing so well with? It's crazy how much money they, they made. Finally shutting up the left side about, you know, outspending out, you know, whatever with, the, the, with Trump. I think what it really comes down to is that Biden is going to have to use every single dollar that he gets to sell the lie that he has made the country better um, under himself than under Trump. All right, it is Friday Eve. We are ready to take on the weekend here on the show. A lot to get to. We're going to have a great panel discussion. By the way, Dave Rubin is here tomorrow. He just interviewed RFK. I want to tell you about that in just a second. But today, the panel is fantastic, as always, right? Doug Collins, former Georgia congressman. He ran for the Senate. He heads the America First Policy Institute's Georgia chapter. Speaking of America First Policy Institute, Hilton Beckham is here. She serves as their communications director, as well as the former director of media affairs in the Trump White House. And then Luke Ball of Mason Burroughs Strategies. It's a conservative media company. He used to be on the Hill. He's going to join us as well. A lot to get to with them. Um, a couple things. I want to talk to you about RFK. He's on the ballot now in North Carolina. He's on the ballot supposedly in Nevada. That's two of the, in my opinion, eight battleground states. Some people say seven, I say eight, but that's a big deal. How he does is going to affect it. And I've told you before, the Biden team is freaking out. We're going to break this down uh, with you for him. Plus a big financial haul for Donald Trump. I told you yesterday, the March numbers came in, boom, boom. I mean, $65 million, 90 on hand among all the Trump entities, the RNC, the campaign, the PAC. That's a big number. It's starting to assuage a lot of the concerns, right? People were freaked out about the number. But then this weekend, remember how Everybody was so impressed with $26 million at Radio City Music Hall with Stephen Colbert, Liza, and two ex-presidents. Well, guess what? One president's going to have an event at Mar-a-Lago this weekend. They're talking over $40 million. Unfortunately, apparently, I can't stroke a big enough check, so I will not be attending. That's a whole nother story. The other thing I want to get to is that there's now an evolving list that the Trump team at least isn't denying on to who's on the short list for VP. Some governors, some senators and some members of Congress, as well as Tulsi Gabbard, former member. I'm going to give you my pick, but I'm going to do this in my own way. I'm going to write it down for you. Okay. I've written my VP pick. I'm putting this in an envelope and I'm sealing it. And I am sending this to producer Ronnie. It just has his first name on there, so you can't go hang out at his house and try to steal this. We will open this live on the day that Trump makes that announcement. But I think I know who it is. I want to lay this out apprentice style for you. So I believe I know who the pick is. I'm going to mail it to him. We'll open it live on air when Trump says it to see if I'm right or not. If I'm not right, we're not going to open it. Anyway, we're going to get into this panel. Doug Collins, Hilton Beckham, Luke Ball. Before we do that, I want to tell you about two amazing sponsors that we have that allow you to bring the show free, no matter whether you're subscribing on YouTube, Rumble, Audio, uh, you know, uh, Spotify or Apple, which you should do. It's all free because of sponsors like this. Let's hear from them, then we'll bring in the panel. Animal lovers, if you've watched the show before, you know about my friends at Delta Rescue. If you can go to deltarescue.org right now and check out the videos of all the great work that they do. You've probably heard me talk about my friend, Leo Grillo. Leo founded Delta Rescue because he thought and knew there was a need for animals, horses, dogs, cats that were malnourished, that weren't getting the veterinary care that they needed, that needed a place to roam freely. Now, you know that shelters take in animals all over the place. You probably have one in your town. But Delta Rescue is different. Delta Rescue is a lifelong sanctuary. This is a no-kill sanctuary. They can go there, get the care and the support they need for life. And if you go to deltarescue.org, like I said, you can go and look at the videos of how amazing this facility is that Leo Grillo has set up. But he started after just rescuing one dog, a Doberman, and realized, I have a lifelong mission to complete now. 
So it relies entirely on our donations. That, that's what keeps it going. So please go there and think about a donation. But more importantly, if you go to the website, deltarescue.org, you'll see the estate planning kit. And that's really what I want you to think about. Can you make Delta Rescue part of your estate so that Leo's mission of caring for these animals is enduring? Well past him, well past me, well past all of us. Go to deltarescue.org, download that estate planning kit and think about making it part of your estate. All right, gentlemen, are you the same man you were 10 years ago? I know I can answer that question pretty honestly. We've probably lost a little bit of muscle, a little bit of energy, and definitely a little bit of testosterone. Our friends at Nugenics Total T, though, have a brand new product out with testosterone boosters that has Tesnor in it. This will help us turn back the clock, give us more energy, give us more ways to build that muscle back, and give us more testosterone. Uh, there's nothing to lose if you want to try it. That's the best part about this. Get your complimentary sample when you text 231231 and enter the code word SPICER. 231231, keyword SPICER. Nugenics Total T Power Booster is backed by clinical studies and it's real science. Its key ingredients have been shown to boost free testosterone levels in men. In other words, this is the science talking. This is what we're talking about. Don't be misled. Many products uh, use generic ingredients and aren't close to the clinical grade that you get in Nugenics Total T. So get a complimentary bottle when you text 231 231, enter that keyword spicer, get a bottle of Nugenics Thermo X complimentary as well. That will help you burn fat. It's a fat incinerator. It's amazing. Text 231 word enter keyword spicer. Texting enrolls you in automated text messages. Consent not required to purchase. Message and data rates may apply. It is the number one recommended brand by primary care physicians based on an independent survey conducted by IQVIA 2022. All right, guys, gang's all here. Um, I want to start with something that I just did. I know this does not sound fair to you guys, but before we started the show, I told everyone, I put in this envelope here who I think Trump's VP pick is going to be. According to Politico, let me just read this out. You don't have to play with, you don't have to color within the lines. We can choose. This is what they wrote. The names under consideration continue to be in flux, according to multiple people familiar with the list who describe it as, quote, being in pencil, not pen, but includes, here's the Senate list. Senator Scott of South Carolina, Senator Vance of Ohio, Senator Katie Britt of Alabama, and Senator Marco Rubio of Florida. Then it says the governors, Christy Nome of South Dakota, Sarah Huckabee Sanders of, of Arkansas, and Doug Burgum of North Dakota. Uh, then he's got sort of the, the House list, which is Byron Donalds and Tulsi Gabbard. That's, again, you don't have to color within the lines if you think it's someone else. But Doug, uh, who do you think makes the best choice or and not even the best choice who do you think trump would pick again it doesn't have to stay with that list but get, throw, give me your take no i think you're within that list uh here but i think it's a it, it's it's a dead in my mind right now it's sort of a, a dead heat between tim scott and sarah huckabee sanders i oh. think that's your that's your two and and it depends on how they want to go and i think that's that, that's really i think where it's at could it be off that list possibly i doubt it um I don't see, I mean, there's some on that list that are just not happening. Tulsi like, Gabbard, a few right, others. I, but I, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's just, that's, I mean, Tulsi has, and I, Tulsi's a good friend, but it's just like, she gets mentioned for everything. Um, and, you know, it's just like, hey, we got something going on. Tulsi will do it. That will go for Tulsi. But I don't think it'll be Tulsi. But I think Sarah and, and Tim both bring something unique to the ticket that, number one, plays well with Donald Trump in the sense of, of, of being, a, a perfect match or foil for his uh, brand of campaigning and how they would campaign. But also it brings uh, a governorship as far as executive experience. It brings something that she's actually done on the table. And Tim Scott is someone he's worked with in Congress who did run for president. But as you know, Donald Trump has said, he was a better campaigner for Trump than he was for himself. So I, I think you're looking at those two. That's my two. You know, I think they're uh, probably 50, 50. And I, and I think maybe 51 for Sarah, because she's not mentioned near as much. Right. The funny thing is I talked to Senator Scott about this the other night at an event. He really truly is having more fun as a surrogate for Trump than a campaign, oh, yeah. uh, than a candidate. Luke, what's your take on this list? It's going to be Joe Exotic. I don't know why there's still a debate. I think that he's going to be able to drop out and be the VP ticket. He's, he, I don't know. He's got it locked up, I think. Came in third for like uh, 
nominee for Oklahoma gubernatorial race. But uh, I think that the the analysis Doug just gave was pretty spot on. I like the Sarah Huckabee Sanders angle because I think it's either got to be somebody who's a female who can appeal to these middle aged suburban women, the voters who I think Trump needs to up his numbers on a little bit, or somebody who is very dynamic and can actually go out there and bring in some of the minority communities that have historically gone for the Democrats. But if we've seen over the last few months and years, ticked up 19 percent for Donald Trump. And I think that someone could come home and clinch that vote. I really like Byron Donalds, but I also think that he's probably got his eyes set on the the gubernatorial race in Florida for a little bit. And he probably would be better served as somebody who is able to be a surrogate for Donald Trump and can continue the media circuit, but ultimately lands back home in Florida. There's a couple folks that like Tulsi Gabbard, I think was an interesting person who had been floated, but Doug's also right. She's literally been floated for everything. So you have to look at any cabinet position that's open right now too. Yeah. and start eliminating based off of that. So like, I think Doug Bergram is going to be the secretary of energy. I think Vivek Ooh. is going to end up going for commerce. I think you start looking at the, the number of people who are in the running for this and start eliminating them by saying, okay, well, would they be good in a particular cabinet yes. position? And you start placing those people aside and you're left with, I think, five or six folks, people like Sarah Huckabee Sanders. So it's going to be interesting, but I'm still holding out. I, I, I actually, I think your thinking is, is spot on, right? Which is that Trump kind of goes, okay, maybe not VP, but I like them for something else. Right. I, I will just say, Hilton, I want you to actually do this. Give me your take before I make my comments. Okay. 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 So I agree with what everyone has said, except, and I love Sarah Huckabee Sanders, but I just cannot see her leaving Arkansas right now. I feel like she just became governor. She's thriving in her role. She might want to, you know, get a little bit more time there before she leaves. And plus she was in DC for so long and maybe she likes being in Arkansas for home for right now. But as much as I would love her as VP pick, I would, I want to go Tim Scott. I don't know if he's as fiery as is a VP pick should be for Trump. And I almost want to lean toward Chris. You need the excitement that Mike Pence brings to the ticket, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Uh (laughs) So I I think we learned. Christy Nome. Christy Nome was at the top of my list until she did the commercial for the dental group the other day. South Dakota's hiring. We stayed open for business during the pandemic. And now businesses are growing so fast, our workforce can't keep up. That's why I'm lending a hand. We have 25,000 open positions. Here in South Dakota, you'll never pay a penny in personal state income tax. And we accept most out-of-state professional licenses. Wait, aren't you Governor Nome? Yes, I am. It's my first day. South Dakota, freedom works here. I don't know what was going on on with that, honestly. One second before we go any further, I just have to say I want to thank uh, Dr. Nelson for the great crown work that he did. In the cor- <laughs> <laughs> we have to pause and do a. <laughs> I honest to God, uh, Nick, I'm, I'm. I mean, Luke, I'm glad you brought that up because I was like, what, what were you thinking? Like yeah, the idea of like, doing a dental commercial for a doctor, by the way, that's in Texas. Well, that's the that's it. Like, what's the trade off there? Like, I understand the South Dakota commercials. Like, I've seen right. a lot of those. I think those are very creative because it's promoting uh, South Dakota businesses and it's in a, in a very personable way. But for somebody down in Texas, and there's a pattern here, like of celebrities doing commercials for this person, uh, for this group or this dental organization oh. that like they're popular and they're trying to get promotions and things like that. It's not driving revenue back to South Dakota and everyone was like, what on earth is this? I wonder if it's her equivalent of the Marco Rubio sipping water in the middle of an interview thing. Where but it's I just will tell like, you, uh, Hilton, Hilton, let me just, I want you to weigh on this. If there's one thing that you can get away with in a Trump vetting contest or audition is going to do a TV commercial. I think Trump probably yes. like, she does have great teeth. She's got amazing teeth. I'm glad she did it. Like, I, I actually think any other administration, you'd be ruled out. But like, he might look at that and be like, wow, I think she did great teeth. And, uh, you know, who's this doctor? Trump always, no matter what, like he, he loves the limelight. He has that Hollywood aspect about him. I mean, a little TV commercial, no matter who it's for. And if it's making money, like, Trump's not going to knock it. Like that's his brand. (laughs) So, I mean, I can see him going that way, but who knows? When I just, when I was, uh, uh, before I did Dancing with the Stars, I was doing some work with America First PAC, which was headed by Linda McMahon. And I had to call her to tell her I was doing Dancing with the Stars. And I was actually initially nervous. I'm like, what's she going to think that one of the senior advisors to the PAC? And then I thought to myself, wait a second, this is the woman who led the WWE. Do you really think she's going to care? About-? And no. I was like, wait, a-. she is like, you, you forget how she is so poised 
uh, and yet she is and graceful and smart. And yet I was like, and, and brilliant as a business person, but I was like, wait a second, this is a woman who grew up around wrestlers. And she's not going to care about it. So, yeah. um, so Doug, the thing that I think is interesting about this list, I mean, you mentioned Tulsi, I I'm with you. Like, I'm sorry at the, I, I think we love to love her because she's a Democrat that says good things about Republicans and craps all over Democrats. She is the Joe Manchin of the house, right. Um, or former house, but the other yeah. names on this list, like I, I just, it makes me cringe when I see Marco Rubio from Florida and Byron Donalds. The bottom line is the constitution is clear about how electoral votes cannot be allocated to people from the same state. Trump is not going to give up 30 electoral votes under the hope that he wins by greater than 30 electoral votes. Yeah. The vice presidency would go bye-bye if, if this got screwed up and was a close election. And I just, I don't know why we are entertaining issues like this. I think that Marco Rubio would be an awesome vice president. I agree with Luke. I think that uh, that Byron Donalds would be great too. But at the end of the day, do you think that Trump is going to give up 30 electoral votes because he thinks that he'll win by that big of a margin and that it's that big of an additive benefit to his ticket? No. And yeah. Plain and simple. No. Look, this is here's an interesting thing. And you got to, I want to go back to something that's, that's sort of behind the scenes here. Number one, I, I love Christy to death. I mean, I, I worked with her in Congress. We, you know, she was, I've known her for a long time. I think there's some other issues besides commercials and other things that would probably keep that uh, from not happening at this point, <laughs> as far as just, you know, the size of the state, where it's located, you know, name ID, those kind of things. But it, it would be a good pick. I, I don't, I think she gets through those, it'd be a good pick. The other part you're dealing with here is this is the best run. And I say this with love to anybody who's worked on the campaign. It's been universally accepted right now. This is the best mechanically run campaign Trump has ever had. Okay. Yeah. The first one was seat of the past. It was pure Trump. Second one took on that sort of sort of feel, but at the same point was was stuttering as and it with the COVID had everything. This one though, with that is running with uh you know Wiles and La Civita. They, I mean, when you have people in Iowa saying this is the best run campaign we've seen out here, we see it in New Hampshire, best run campaign we've seen out here, and that's when they're winning. That tells me, and I say all that to say they're not going to leave anything on the table. They're fighting for a Nebraska electoral vote right yep. now. Think about that. So they're not going to give up any electoral votes coming out of Florida. I, Luke's great pick. I love Byron. Great guy. I've known him since he came in, interviewed him many times. Good guy, governor of Florida. Yeah, Marco Rubio. I come from a part of the Republican Party, like in Georgia. He won't play at all. I mean, it's just that's there's I mean, Marco's a great guy, but he's he missed his moment. I think a few years ago, and so I think you're going to look at somebody new or fresh. You're going to look at. I think a wild wild card here would be a Burgum, but I agree with Luke. That's more of a cabinet yeah. pick, um, and because they're going to look for what actually moves numbers, and I think that's who's in his ear right now. So that's why I see these. Uh, He's not going to give up anything. So, Luke, the thing that's interesting about what Doug's saying is we all look at this and the conversation that we're having is all about who could help augment the ticket, who could help here, who could bring something. I, I got to say, every once in a while, I, I reset myself and I say, from what I know about Donald Trump's thinking, that's not how he thinks. He thinks who's going to be a good partner to me, right? He didn't think about Mike Pence in the sense that he's going to carry Indiana. He thought about Mike Pence is going to help me. He understands government. Uh, he could really help with the evangelical. But he looked at him as a as someone who got the role that he wanted it as he thought of it in his head. And I think that as we, th that's why I, I agree with everybody on the Doug Burgum for say energy. But what I were, what I want to emphasize to people is that I think the way that Trump is going to analyze this is who do I, who is going to be a partner to me? Who is going to understand the role as I've defined it? Who is going to be, uh, embrace the MAGA America first agenda and be a genuine partner to me to carry it out as opposed to who's going to help me in a particular state or with the demographic. And that's where I think, and you've, if you've heard Don Jr., he's been on the show, you've heard, you know, all the people that have been around Trump that are giving him advice. Every one of them will say, we're not buying into identity politics. We're not buying into this. We want to have the best partner for Trump. And I think that is where this thing tweaks. Joe Biden chose someone because they were a black female. He said it himself. I don't think Trump cares about the identity thing. And I think he's saying, as he meets with these people, who am I most comfortable with? 
Yeah, definitely. So Trump is a numbers guy. And so I believe that this is where two factors marry, where number one, who is doing best in the ratings? Who's on television? Who's savvy in the media? Who's a really good surrogate who can drive up those numbers on ratings? And then also who does well in the polling and makes up for a gap that perhaps Trump isn't doing so well with in a couple of areas with the voters, like some minority voters and women voters and people who have historically not gone in the direction of the Republican Party over the last 10 years. So I think it's going to be this arch, right? Where somebody who is doing very well in the ratings and somebody that he sits down and looks at and says, okay, well, my polling numbers go up when I'm paired with this hypothetical person. And it's where those two people meet that I think his pick's going to come from. And ultimately, when it comes down to it, I think that it's going to be somebody who is able to appeal to these voters that you know, are a little bit on the fence, maybe some independent voters, people that he wants to bring in. It's why Tulsi's name has come up so often, because they believe that she can appeal to independent voters as a former Democrat switching to independent. She's a female served in the military, things of that nature. So she checks a lot of boxes as somebody that Roger Stone's been pushing very hard for. So there is no clear answer. It's why there's no clear front runner right now for this position, because I believe Trump likes a lot of people for this spot. But he's also said, according to, you know, reports that like, you know, there's some people who just simply try too hard. There's some folks that he doesn't think <laughs> right. are the, the ones who are going to be able to place in this position and actually do well in it. And that element that you were just talking about, Sean, somebody who can come alongside and augment, that's a very niche area in politics. Somebody who doesn't want the limelight all the time, like Mike Pence was in 2016, but can come alongside and support the president without trying to think so much about 2028 ambitions. And I believe that once you find that arc between the ratings, somebody who makes up in the pollings, and then maybe that center point right there, that cornerstone where they're not someone who's going to be flamboyant and taking numbers away from Trump. That's where all those three elements are going to fall together and you're going to get your final name. When you lose power, and I'm talking an hour, maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe two months, are you going to be ready? I know I am. In my house, I have a Patriot Power Generator 2000X. And if you go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer, you can get one too. Here's what I love about it. You can literally bring it inside your house. There are no fumes and no noise. It powers completely off the solar panels that come with it. You can power your refrigerator, medical devices, phones, computers, all of your family's needs. There are four outlets plus USB outlets. All of that comes with it. The greatest thing about it, as I said, is there's no cords coming in and out of your house, no gas to refill. It all powers off of those free solar panels that come with it. So you will be ready in a time of crisis to take care of you and your family. And if something else happens down the road, you can take the Patriot Power Generator 2000X, put it in your car, bring it to a friend, a family member's house, and set it up easily just for them. Again, it's all powered off of these solar panels that come free with it. So go to fourpatriots.com slash Spicer to make sure that you will be ready in a time of crisis. You know, Hilton, the thing that I think about Tulsi is, for me, uh, I look at Tulsi, as I said to Doug, as somebody who uh, we love because she was a she, she hates the Democratic Party and she says so. But this is a woman who endorsed Bernie Sanders after she dropped out of the race. She is not a, an America first policy. She's getting closer. She has embraced more policies and she says great things against Democrats. But I, and again, I'm glad you have her echoing some of the things, but I just don't think that the MAGA base would embrace Tulsi Gabbard. No, she, the vibe she gives me is when we all kind of got excited over RFK because he was like coming out and, and supporting Trump on issues. And I was like, oh my God, there's this Democrat who actually thinks like us. But then at the end of the day, you realize he's still a Democrat and he supports things that we are vehemently against. So she has that glamour about her that like, oh, okay, she can kind of, you know, walk both sides of the aisle. But Again, she she's a Democrat. She believes things that we couldn't vote for. And and if you have her in the presidency, like no telling what direction things could go. So I I, I like Tulsi. I love her background. I wouldn't want to see her as VP. Um, yep. But also to go off what Luke said about um, having a female vice president. And I agree with you, Sean, too. I think Trump really looks at the numbers and 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 who he would partner well with. But what I'm concerned with is since Democrats, the only thing they have to run on in this election season is abortion. Yes. And having a female vice president who would be able to sway the female voters who we all know Trump has, you know, a hard time with, that would be 
that would be the only thing for me. I hate, I hate going into sexist politics and being like, we need a female. I hate that kind of rhetoric, but I do see that benefiting Trump right. if we have to fight off abortion. And, and Sean, real Trump. quick, uh, I'm yeah. sorry, Doug, real quick. Okay. Tulsi's, if she were tapped, her singular job would be to get Donald Trump across the finish line in a general election and win independent voters over for him. After that, I don't remember what vice president or president said it, but they basically said that the vice presidency is equivalent to a bucket of warm horse, you know what. And ultimately, it's <laughs> someone going around opening grocery stores and attending. Yeah, but I, I agree with you. I just I, 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 and I, I don't doubt it. But I think what Trump because you mentioned Roger Stone and some of these other people. One of the things that I know that a lot of people are putting in Trump's ear is you you need to think about who is going to carry on the mantle for you, right? Who is going to be oh, the well, heir yeah. to, to America there, first? Point, and, like Don Jr. can come in and start doing that as that's well. It. I mean, Doug's there's, putting there's, there's an entire, you know, four years after the general election for them to be able to pick up that mantle and take it. And I doubt that Tulsi is going to be on the spear of the MAGA movement. Yeah, moving right, forward. But that's my point, though, is that why pick somebody like if you're Trump, you want somebody who when you go away, Doug just posted 2028. He's right. I want someone if I'm Trump that says this is the heir to the MAGA America first movement. And well, Tulsi Pence Gabbard not. is not that like, person. Pence was never going to be the heir to the MAGA but, movement. But he was the one that got him across the and finish I, line. I, 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 I think we're all missing here. Doug? Trump, I'm going to be very blunt. Trump doesn't care about 2028. I'm going to just be blunt about it. I don't think he I, – I do not think this pick is his determination on who – I don't think he – and, and really, because and I and talking to him and knowing like most of us do, I don't think he's thinking about who's replacing me. He's thinking about I'm the man, which he is. I know, so but I, don't you want somebody? So would you rather have? Let's just let's just reset this. Would you rather have somebody right now? Trump picks someone, and he says, "I want someone who is the heir to the to the America First agenda that will keep it going." Because remember, DeSantis hit him. On this, oh, two terms is better than one. Didn't you want? Do you want someone who can say I can continue this, or would you rather have someone that says I'm going to be your vice president and I will not seek the presidency? Just let, let me go around real quick, Doug. Which one do you want, the former or the latter? Look, I don't think you're going to get the former, the first one from the president. I just don't see that. That's just out of character for him because it's acknowledging his uh, descendancy, if you would. So, I just so no, no. Happens. Okay, so answer my question though. Do you think that he picks someone and he says, uh, you know, pick someone on the list? Sarah Huckabee Sanders, Marco Rubio, Scott, whatever. I, you, I want you to be my VP, but you have to pledge you won't seek the presidency. No, no. I, I look. My main thing at this point, I don't. I think that's a killer for anybody that wants to do this because it is a four-year term. I think the other thing is too is though is I, I'm at a point now, Sean. I want a VP that can help Donald Trump get elected. Period. I, I get Just it, but but, but what is he's as he's vetting these people? He's either thinking one of two mindsets: this person is going to be the the person that can carry on the mantle, or I don't want them because I want to be the man. But you have to. No, have, I that think he's going to pick somebody to win this year. I think. I so think that's honestly, what Luke's saying. Yeah. yeah, I think it's just it's a this year pick. I don't see it as a four year pick. I see it yeah. as a this year pick that then has connotations of twenty twenty eight. Now, yeah, but I don't you think I, I get – okay, so I get all that, right? In his mind, it's like get me over the finish line and I don't care. But you can't tell me that every reporter, every operative, every influencer isn't thinking whoever that person is, are you – I mean it's just how do you – you can't well, avoid well, that. I mean it's, it's, the, it's the cocktail party game in D.C., you know, Sean. Come on. Yeah, I know. But what am I going to do? But, but is it going to turn into something like – is it going to turn into something like Mike Pence, where at the very end, like he turned on him and then they started using fodder from Mike Pence to attack Trump? Like, is that the mindset well, he's going to have? This yeah, is and, exactly and politics why Tulsi is not the person. This is exactly is, why. Yeah, exactly. And so, like, you're never going to get to 2028 unless you get past 2024. And Trump needs to expand his appeal to voters beyond the Republican I, base. So much happened over four years that maybe Pence might have been considered the MAGA heir moving on. But it will be like betting on the Super Bowl four years from now without knowing what the, the teams Patriots. are and what the dynamics are. The Patriots. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> there, there, yeah. No, no air in the ball there. Look, no, yeah. no air. Yeah, there is no air. With the yeah. <laughs> All right. Look, well, here's the thing. Okay, could y'all anybody come into Georgia and look? And, and I and I hate. I mean, this is tough because Tulsi, I consider a personal friend. I've known her. We came into yeah. Congress together. I've been to Hawaii. We've toured. I, I, we've got a lot of history. Okay, but in all fairness, there's certain aspects of Tulsi's positions I can't vote for. I get it, okay? and that's exactly my and, point, though. I think you're right. 
And so I just think, I think you're looking at that. We're looking at this in a microcosm. I believe the final determination, and Luke, I think, has hit it. Hilton, I think, has hit it as well, Sean. I think the final determination is who gets us the votes we need to get the Electoral College, period. End of statement. Everything else, the, the reporters at Politico and Punchbowl and everywhere else in the world can play their games. But at the end of the day, I think for Donald Trump, it's, how can I get back in the White House? And if that's with this person, great. If it's see, with this, this person, is, great. This is the one thing I, I agree with this, except knowing his thinking. You going to Donald Trump and saying, hey, Mr. President, here is a list of all the people you're considering. Here's who polls best to get you back in the White House. Donald Trump thinks he's the one person that can get him back in the White House. He doesn't think anyone else. I, I just don't think his mindset is focused on who can help me. He actually thinks that they he helps them. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree, but I'm going to jump in one time and be quiet. I don't. I disagree with the premise that came up about five minutes ago that says that uh, some of the MAGA movement or however you want to put it, Republican Party, we've attempted in the last several cycles to do identity politics, and we've yes. failed miserably. Uh, we don't that, admit it. For, we don't me, admit it, but we have. Look at Senate races. Look at yes. other races. Governor. And so I, I think you're right about the part that that there's this I, that we don't do identity politics. Yeah, we do. We just don't do it as well as the other side. Right. Well, and that's why I'm going to tell you, I think that my pick is exactly what you're saying, which is I don't think at the end of the day he cares about identity politics. I want to kind of pivot. Trump's had a good week. I mentioned this yesterday. Trump and the RNC raised $65 million in March, which I think has settled everyone's concerns. This weekend, Hilton, he's down at uh, Mar-a-Lago. All of these big donors have put together this event at Mar-a-Lago. The reports are right now 43 million dollars top amount you can give is eight hundred and sixty thousand dollars per person i i mean i was gonna go but i have a conflict and so i can't make it um <laughs> and but i mean we we gushed over joe biden and radio city music hall with stephen colbert and lizzo raising uh 26 million bucks 40 three million dollars at one event that's got to just shut everybody up Oh, yeah. I know. I was looking at the numbers and I forgot because I figured because I kept hearing, you know, it's a historic number that Biden came in. And then I went back to Biden's number and I was like, oh, it's only 25, 26. OK, um, pennies compared to this. But yeah, it's crazy how much money they they made finally shutting up the left side about, you know, outspending out, you know, whatever with the, the with Trump. But I think it's crazy that you look back at 2020 the same time this year and it's it we've broken they said that was a historic number that they hit with fundraising and we've broken that so uh it's amazing numbers but i think what it really comes down to is that biden is going to have to use every single dollar that he gets to sell the lie that he has made the country better um <laughs> under himself than under trump and uh, he's just going to keep trying to bang that drum over tr trump that he he has a better economy better border better whatever but um trump and it's now fully stacked with cash and he has the right message and people think it was better under him than under biden so i think he's fully raring to go luke do you think that this event this weekend just shuts everyone up on the money front I don't think it shuts them up, but it stunts their argument. Yeah. And the argument that they had over the last few weeks was essentially ridiculous. It was like saying that, oh, look, a runner is tired because they're about to start this 5K when they just ran another 5K right before it. Like Biden did not have a primary election, so he didn't have to spend money against right. his primary opponents. Donald Trump had to spend money going across the nation and having these rallies and things like that because he had primary opponents. And now they dropped out. It's why we wanted to unify early on. It's why we were so highly critical of other people in this race that had no shot whatsoever, but just wanted to stay in because they had an ax to grind, a book to sell, or an ego to stroke. And when it comes down to it, I think that the evolution that the RNC has had over the last few weeks is very, very good. I've had some meetings at the GOP over the last couple of weeks for work, and I would equate it to going into like a swimming pool that needs to be shocked with chlorine, and the muddy water is going away, and now it's clearing up, and there's a singular mission, and people have been refocused, and we're all driving 
in one direction. We've come alongside one another and things are clear now. So now people are more confident to give resources to the GOP and the RNC, where before they weren't quite sure because they didn't know all the things that money was being spent on, like limousines and flowers and things like that, millions and millions of dollars. And now they've caught up the party from 20 and 30 years ago with these country club Republicans to the party of the working man and woman and the American people. And now folks are more confident giving money to this because they know what the mission is, they know what they're giving to, and they know what the stakes are. It is Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, and the RNC is there to help in the fight with Trump. You know, Doug, as a former member of Congress and a guy who ran for the Senate, you're you're no stranger to raising money. Do you think that these March numbers and this big event are a sugar high, meaning Michael Watley, the new RNC chairman, and Chris Lasavita and Susie Wilde said, hey, we need to come in and basically go 24-7 to show people we can get the money back in. And kind of what Luke was saying that, hey, it's safe to swim again, put your money here. Is this a sugar high month where they just loaded it all up because they needed to, to show people they could do it? Or is this sustainable? Is, have donor, is there donor fatigue that's going to set in in April and May? If the, uh, Sean, that's a great question because I was sitting here and taking notes, and I agree with with Hilton and Luke on a, a lot of this stuff. But here's I, as someone who has raised money, who's done this deep dive. Here's my question, and I haven't seen this in the RNC. Where did they get the six six million? Was it big donors? Did they did they did they go back and tap the big donor list and that which is which is actually good if you consider they're also raising forty four million and they're not overlapped in these two events. Okay. Right. So the sixty six million or sixty million plus at, at the RNC, then you got the the donor meeting down in in Mor Lago this weekend. Um so but if it's a return of if it's all big donors, then that is a sugar high. Because a lot of those will be tapped out. They can't go any further. And, and that's the key it, thing, what you're saying there, just to remind people, if you give your 860000 bucks, you can't give any more. You're tapped out. That's yeah. the key. The low dollar can go 25, 25, 25, or 200, yeah, And 200. that's been an interesting – Yeah, and, and Rashawn, I apologize to interrupt it. But that's no. where the problem is. And look, I've got a lot of friends in the in the fundraising outside of this house and stuff, and they will tell you across the board, low dollar, uh, small dollar is not as – it, there, especially on the Republican side, you're not seeing the return on investment that we've seen before. That's why you're seeing. And I mean, there's been some comments about that. We may have run that horse for a little while, you know, because we've been doing it constantly for four years almost. Um, so I think my I think it's it's not a sugar high in its essence, but it does reflect something that was said earlier. It reflects now that we've got all of the, the debris out of the way. Yeah. I mean, and I say debris in a kind way, but you have people who was running for president who were taking in two and three, four million dollars or Nikki Haley, who was suffering off Democrat money, which I appreciate she was doing. But, <laughs> but for the most part, you know, now those there's not a there's not a well, boy, I really like Nikki. I like Ron. I like these. I'm going to give a little money because I like to play the future game here. Now it's OK. Here's the bill. If Donald Trump or, or Joe Biden, I want Donald Trump. And the, 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 the numbers are getting stroked at this point. So I think that's you'll see how that comes out. But again, my question will be is how the bigger donors come in and then what is uh, small donors coming in later? Before we move on, I want to ask you guys serious, like a, a, a question I always think is, is intriguing and, be, and, and I'm being serious on this. Like I just mentioned to go to this Mar-a-Lago event this weekend, the max out number is 860 grand, right? Um, cause it's, it's a combination of the campaign, the PAC, the RNC, and then all these state parties that are part of this joint fundraising committee that they have. But in a, in a serious way, I can't imagine the amount of money that I would have to have made <laughs> in my life in the bank to stroke an $860,000 check to a candidate. Hilton, like, I always joke with people like, what's your number to retire, right? What is the number? <laughs> how much money do you need in the bank to say, I'll write you an $860,000 check for your campaign? Oh, my God. I, oh God, I can't even tell you. That's why I plan on marrying rich. So I, don't, you know, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, a lot of money. Need, a lot more than that. Yeah. Oh, I can't even imagine. Like the Linda McMahons of the world. That's how I want to retire. I want to be a Linda McMahon. Do you, need a billion, do you need a billion dollars to write that check, Luke? No, because thanks to uh, Biden's inflation, it's more like $100,000 for all of us. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Doug, when you when you hit, I mean, if you were, you've been in, I know you didn't hit up people for 860 grand, but I mean, at that level, who are you talking about? Are these all billionaires? I got some oh, text wow. messages from Doug actually during his races. So I'm not sure about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, appreciate, I appreciate that 300,000 you stroked. I appreciate You're that. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's on the way. <laughs> uh, no, Doug, uh, I just I just looked it up in the FEC database. Luke is $30. $30? <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, that was a typo. I meant three. So yeah, I, I want a $27 reimbursement on that. Yeah, all right. believe me. 
we we brought up our we brought up RFK before. I want to I want to move on because um, he he did this clip on CNN. Um, let me if if I want to play it for everybody just to see because this is what got everybody in the news freaked out over the weekend. Uh, let's play it now. So I can make the argument that President Biden is a much worse threat to democracy. And the reason for that is President Biden is the first candidate in history, the first president in history that has used the federal agencies to censor political speech, so to censor his opponent. I, you know, I can say that because I just won a case in the Federal Court of Appeals and now before the Supreme Court. It shows that he started censoring not just me. 37 hours after he took the oath of office, he was censoring me. No president in the country has ever done that. The greatest threat in democracy is not somebody who questions election returns, but a president of the United States who used the power of his office to force the social media companies, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, to open a portal and give the access to that portal to the FBI, to the CIA, to the IRS, to CISA, to NIH, to censor his political critics. Think about that. Here is RFK Hilton on CNN. The minds, I I almost wanted to, to imagine what it was like to be sitting there as a producer or an executive at CNN when RFK is saying that Joe Biden is a bigger threat to democracy than Donald Trump. Their minds must have been going. <sighs> Their minds must have been cut to commercial, cut to commercial. This yeah. is how we want to air right now. Yeah, but I mean, he's speaking the truth. He's saying what all of us are thinking. Like he's the 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 party that's claiming to that Trump is the threat to democracy is trying to kick off RFK from the ballot. I mean, that's the bottom line. They're the ones who are threats to democracy, and RFK is just calling it out. And now RFK is kind of like the fly in the oil for them, where he's not like a huge threat, but he's a big enough threat where they have to push resources to make sure that he doesn't get on the ballot to take away that small margin that Biden needs to win. Yeah, look, the thing that I think is interesting is they, I mean, sort of RFK has become somewhat of an enigma. I think a lot of Trump folks like him, especially because of his stance on vaccines. But at the end of the day, he is a Democrat. He is a pro-choice Democrat you know, anti-gun. I mean, like, this is a guy who is a lifelong liberal progressive Democrat. We just kind of like him in some of the same ways that we like Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah, my opinion on RFK Jr. has flopped from week to week because I genuinely have not been able to pinpoint down quite yet like who he's a major threat to. And I think that shifted when he tapped his vice president pick. And essentially, like all the the people who were supporting him and Republicans were upset. I was glad that he picked a left wing liberal donor to run on his ticket because then it it, it, right. it uh, dismissed a lot of Trump voters that might have gone over to his side for whatever reason or people who were leaning Republican. And so if he is more a threat to the Democratic Party, then you're going to see the Democrats start attacking him a little bit more. If you see the Republicans start attacking RFK Jr. more and more often, it means that he is apparently a threat based off of polling to the people that they're trying to appeal to. So I was against RFK Jr.'s race right now or a couple weeks ago. And then when he picked his vice presidential nominee, I was like, maybe this guy understands the dynamic of the field or what's going on right now, because he went from he's a threat to Republicans to a threat to Democrats and back and forth. He was siphoning off voters from Democrats. People were saying that he was going to appeal to the Trump base. He's all over the map. And I think that he doubled down on being a threat to the Democrats with the VP nominee, but it might change again in two weeks. So, Doug, what I think Luke said that it was so spot on, not that everything wasn't, was actions, <laughs> basically actions speak louder than words. Trump is saying, yeah. I'm glad that RFK is in the race. The Democrats hired an entire team to work out of the DNC to attack and undermine RFK, right? They're saying he's not a real Kennedy. They're going after his ballot access options. These guys, if you want to know who is he a threat to, look at the actions of the two campaign. Trump's like, hello, RFK, welcome to the race. Joe Biden and his team are actually spending money going after him. That says to me, you don't go after a guy who's not a threat to you or who is probably helping you. They're spending time and money going after this guy. Well, remember, I mean, I think the, the big thing, 2020, we had the absence of a third party candidate. 2016, we had a third party candidate and it actually hurt Joe Biden. It hurt Hillary Clinton. I apologize. Hillary Clinton, that was the Stein candidacy in the Green Party. Now you actually have Stein running, you have Kennedy running and you have uh, Cornell West still running and siphoning off. I the the part that I agreed with most on uh, Luke and I had it written down right here was VP. 
he told me with that pick, he is go he looked at the polls and he said, I'm looking at these uncommitted voters in Michigan. I'm looking at these uncommitted voters in California and all these other places who are uncommitting for, for Joe Biden because they all have a similarity. All of those uncommitted for similarities are not moderate Democrats. They're not even what we would call you know, normal left wing Democrats. They're the far left Democrats. And what did he do? He went out and picked a far left defund the police back Garcon, uh, Gar whatever his name is down the DA down in LA. I mean, this is somebody who, I mean, if the left is here, she, I mean, she's over here. So um, that that's the direct problem the Democrats have right now. And I think it makes it very easy. Trump, the, the Trump team can lay off of Kennedy as long as they need to. They don't need to, to play in this unless they then saw something in the fall. And then all the, and then it makes it easy. All you got to do is run a picture of her giving money to uh, defund the police, you know, immigration issues. This, and it's a quick done in any state where it got man, got problem. Here would have been the problem is it's like we said, if he had picked somebody for the most part that a disaffected Republican could have voted for. And yes. I think that's that didn't happen. So this is over as far as, uh, you know, the who's the threat. But remember, the bigger problem here is, is most of the third party candidates are not. It has to be a lot closer in some of these swing states for it to really make a difference, because at the end of the day, it's not popular vote. It's, it's electoral college and none of these will win the ele uh, an electoral uh, vote. Yeah, I said this over and over and over again. It only matters. You can poll 30 percent if you're not on a ballot and someone can't vote for you. It doesn't matter. RFK just got himself on the North Carolina ballot, which is big. They say they're on the Nevada ballot. Uh, those are two swing states that I think matter. Hilton, I'm going to give you the final word. Who does RFK help or hurt? Oh, Biden. I think it, I breathed a sigh of relief when RFK went on stage to announce his VP pick and he started off with a land acknowledgement and had a, like a Native American on there, you know, <laughs> beating a drum and acknowledging whoever tribe owned that land. It was game over. He's taking the the left leaning independents and, and the Democrats from Biden. We have nothing to worry about. Okay. All right. I'll take that to the bank. Uh, <laughs> Doug Hilton, Luke, thank you guys for being here. Guys, tomorrow, great conversation coming your way with Dave Rubin. He's going to close out the week with us. He'll always is bring the fire. He's been tracking RFK. He literally had him on a show. We can ask him about that. Uh, so if you have a question that you want me to ask Dave, put it in the comments section below. Please continue to support the show by subscribing to YouTube, Rumble, Apple, Spotify, all those things. Go to seanspicershow.com slash VIP to join the VIP community. We'll see you back here tomorrow to close out the week on The Sean Spicer Show. Well, if you enjoyed this content, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and click the notification bell to get more.